All right, well, just want to, again, welcome you to our class, The Eternal Blueprint, as we are continuing to look at what it means, uh, God's eternal purpose and all that means. And so, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 1, and we're looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, when Paul prayed a prayer, which is really an incredible prayer. It's one I highly recommend that you pray on a regular basis, but in this prayer, Paul revealed not only a, a prayer that we should pray, but also unveiled something that, as we've been talking about, is so important because we tend to be so focused on our inheritance in Christ, don't we? we we're so focused on God's blessings and God's blessings for me, but we never really think about his inheritance in us. And Paul is praying and he says, He's praying for the Ephesians, but you can pray this for yourself. You can pray this for your church, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And he goes on in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you would know what is the hope of his calling, what are the glory of the riches of his inheritance in the saints. Now I want to stop right there and just say what an incredibly beautiful uh, verse that is, that it's the, the Lord's inheritance in the saints. So you think about it, I know, I know wherever you're listening, it might be different in your country, probably not, but I know in America, Americans are so focused on my inheritance in Christ, my blessings in Christ, my position in Christ. And I'm not, all that's great. We, we need to know the blessings of God. We need to know our inheritance in Christ. That's important. But there's something even more important than that, and that is God's inheritance in his people. And so I want us to shift for a second here from what's in it for me, and that, that's kind of the mentality we have so often when we're listening to a message. Okay, what's in it for me? How does this apply to me? What's in it for me? How's this going to affect my life? What's the application that I can put into my life? And I want us to flip that a little bit and say, what's in it for God? That's really what the eternal purpose is all about. That's really what this class is all about. What is in it for God? And you know, all of us, myself included, we are so bent on being selfish, self-oriented, self-focused, what's in it for me, that we rarely think, okay, what's in it for God? What is God getting out of that? And I think as we talk about God's eternal purpose, again, we always ask, what does it mean? What is it about? And, and so... I want us to flip the script for a second and say, what's in this for God? What's in this for God? What is God getting out of this? And it's in his people. And so we've looked at the inheritance of the father and, and having a mature corporate son that is conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And then in the last session, we talked about the inheritance of the son who would have a, a bride, an equally yoked bride, made ready for him. And we talked about that. So in this session, uh, session seven, part seven, we're looking at the spirits, the spirits' inheritance in the saints. And so just as we talk about this, we, the, the, the Holy Spirit has an inheritance in the saints, which is a temple that he fills, a house in which he dwells, and a body that he possesses to Christ-like maturity. And so you remember all the way back in part four that we looked at individual fullness and what that looked like. And so that's very important. In fact, I would say if you don't have individual fullness, you'll never have corporate fullness. But in this session, when we talk about the Holy Spirit's inheritance in the saints, we're really focused now on corporate fullness because what God is doing here at the end of the age, he wants to do corporately. This idea of this Lone Ranger Christian on this deserted island, him and God and God alone, and he's fulfilling that entire thing. Well, that's not really scriptural because what the Lord wants to do is he wants to 
bring us all together as a corporate body. We can't do this alone. God will not let us do this alone. It is a corporate thing God is doing. And so individual fullness is the beginning, the precursor to corporate fullness. But God's ultimate intention is to have a corporate expression of Jesus Christ in the earth. Now, where do we get that? Let's turn now to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. It's a beautiful passage of scripture. It's actually, if you had your Bible open, you can just a couple of verses down, and the Lord's talking about the church. And in verse 22, he says, And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him as head over all things to the church. Verse 23 which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. If you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you were baptized into his body. If you're born of the Spirit, you were baptized into his body. What an incredibly beautiful picture that is, that, that the church is not a place you go on Sunday. The church is not a place where you hear a message and sing some music. Though that, you, you know, that's what we do when we gather. The church is not a service. The church is not an event. The church is literally the body of Jesus Christ on the earth. Isn't that incredible? You are the body of the literal body, and I don't mean literal, I mean he's got a body. I mean you are, because of the Spirit of God dwelling in you, you are his body expressing his life in the earth. That is a beautiful picture. Now notice what he says. The church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And the idea is right here, Paul captures it. He says, when, basically, I'm going to summarize it this way. When the, whole, when the Holy Spirit fills all, in all, the Holy Spirit in all, in other words, he's talking about those who have the Holy Spirit in them, those who have the Holy Spirit in him, Christ in you, all those who have Christ in you, when he fills all those individual members, and that's his goal, is then he will have the fullness of, of Jesus Christ. The fullness of Jesus Christ is not contained in one local church. It's not contained in one conference. It's not contained in one gathering of the saints. It is a global, worldwide expression of the life of Jesus Christ as the individual members of the body of Christ are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that together, as an interdependent body, we become the expression of Jesus Christ in the earth in a local setting, in a local church, and then as a global body that he has. And God's aim is to bring the individual members unto fullness and then to join together the individual members who are filled with the Holy Spirit together as living stones so God might have a spiritual house God might have a temple he dwells in. God might have a body that he possesses. That is the Holy Spirit's inheritance in the saints. Now, as we talk about this, you know, you, I'm sure if you've, been in, if you've been in the church for a while, you are familiar with 1 Corinthians 3.16 when Paul made a revolutionary statement to the Corinthians. I mean, this had to just shock them. It had to stun the Corinthians who were familiar with the temple and all that it means. But Paul is basically saying, you know, you see, you know the temple that's in Jerusalem? Well, you're now the temple. You are the temple now that God dwells in. I mean, that is a revolutionary statement. And he was talking first individually, but then corporately, that because the spirit of the living God dwells inside of you, because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, you are the dwelling place of God in the earth. What an incredible, incredible, shocking, shocking statement. And Paul says, do you not know? And, and the Corinthians, you know, they were carnal. They were doing all kinds of crazy things, all kinds of indulging of the flesh, all kinds of things. 
but yet they were still performing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Paul was like, okay, do you not know this? You're a temple of God. You are the dwelling place of God in the earth. And it's just an incredible revelation. And, and just even, even for us, you know, just to think about that, think about that often in your life, that you are the temple of the living God. Now, you know, if you are familiar with the Old Testament, that the Old Testament had, the Old Testament temple had an outer court, it had a holy place, and it had the Holy of Holies. Well, the New Testament temple also has an outer court, which is our body, this body we have, the five senses we have, that is like the outer court. Then the inner court or the holy place is your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, your personality, all that makes you you, your desires, your motives, everything that makes you who you are, your soul is like the holy place. And deep inside of you, where the naked eye has never seen, you've never seen your spirit, yet you have a spirit. That place deep inside of you the holy of holies deep inside of you is now where God has taken up residence to dwell. What, what, how incredible is that? Just the Holy Spirit now dwells in you. And you are a temple. You are the holy of holies. You are the holy of holies where God now dwells. See, so just like... In the Old Testament, when the Ark of the Covenant would, wherever they would place the Ark of the Covenant, and the glory of God would come, and they would inquire of God by the Ark of the Covenant, and all the enemies of Israel would be defeated by this Ark of the Covenant. And it was a place where you, when David put it in Odom Edom's, Obed Edom's house, everything he had began to be blessed. Well, you have that very Ark inside of you. You have Christ in you. You have a place in you where you can go commune with God at any moment. You have that place in you where you are blessed, where you can commune with him, where the enemy is defeated. You need to tap into that place inside of you called the Holy of Holies in your spirit. And so what that means on a practical level, wherever you go, this is a challenge to us, wherever you go, you carry God with you. You go to the grocery store, God's going with you. You go to the restaurant, God's going with you. You go to the mountains, you go to the beach, wherever you go, God is going with you. You literally are carrying the presence of God like the Ark of the Covenant wherever you go because God dwells in you, okay? So when you're riding in rush hour traffic and someone cuts you off and you want to immediately give them the, the gesture, remember God dwells in you. And if you have a fish sticker or whatever, a fish on the back of your car, definitely do not put any kind of gesture up to the person, okay? So God dwells in you. The Lord dwells in you. What an incredible, incredible promise that is. Now, as awesome as that is, and as much as we need that revelation, God does not, God wants to bring us to something even deeper than that, and that is his corporate temple. God is corporate. God is into the corporate. God is into his, the gathering of his people. So there's something greater than just the individual temples possessing God. The Lord wants to make his local gathering, his ecclesia, a dwelling place of God in the spirit. And so Paul's talking about that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. He's talking about this corporate temple. I want, to, I want us to turn there. It's one chapter over. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Paul says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Now catch this, 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. 
in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. See, every time you gather with the church, every time the local ecclesia gathers together, you as an individual temple with the Holy of Holies dwells in you, you're gathering with however many are gathering together, you're gathering together with those who have Christ in them. And as you come together, you're being built together into a, a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, I like what Paul says in here is that you are be, you are, uh, you're growing into a temple in the Lord. Now, we don't, automatically, we don't automatically become this holy of holies dwelling place when we gather. It's something we have to grow into. It's something I think we have to learn as individual temples that we have the Holy Spirit. We want to have the Holy Spirit have us entirely, right? And so as we gather together, we're growing into a temple of God. We're going, growing into this corporate temple of the Holy Spirit. It's, it, it, we're being fitted together. And if you've been part of a local church, you know that fitting process is not always fun because the Lord is sanding away and chiseling away a lot of times at us. A lot of times when things are going, we, we, something might offend us or something might you know, annoy us or something might just bother us. You know, we often say, well, it's wrong with them, it's wrong with them. And the Lord's like, maybe, but how about you look at yourself first? Perhaps I'm trying to do something in you to fit you together with another living stone so you can be that vital piece of this corporate picture God wants to build, this dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So now... When we talk about this dwelling place of God in the Spirit, I, I just say that I can, I, I just know the, the Lord's heart is, His heart is He wants to make every local gathering of His people not the outer court, not the holy place. He wants us to be a holy of holies dwelling place of God in the Spirit. God is not coming to fill this house and your house and your church, he's not coming to fill it with the outer court or the holy place. God is jealous for the holy of holies. And so we want our church to be a holy of holy dwelling place of God in the spirit. Now, it's very important that we understand that as we, what we could get away with in the outer court would get us killed in the holy of holies. And I think that's one reason why God has withheld his glory for so long upon the church. Because you think about it in the first century when the glory of God was poured out upon the first century church. And the first century church became that holy of holy dwelling place of God in the spirit. Is if you lied, you died. Sorry, my allergies are really acting up. Let me, one second. Apologize for that. I, if you're, I'm, uh, if you're not, if you're watching this either on tape or online, uh, pollen is really bad right now in uh, Georgia, and so anyway, it's really affected me. If I'm crying, I'm not being touched by what I'm saying, although it, sh it should make you cry. But anyway, it's allergies right now, so I apologize for that. So hopefully, I can keep getting through this. But my point is this: in the first century. In the first century, if you lied, you died. <laughs> Ananias and Sapphira. I mean, if the Holy Spirit came like he did in the first century to most churches, there would be mass casualties. The glory of God, what you can get away with in the outer court, you cannot get away with in the Holy of Holies. God wants to make our churches holy of holy churches. God wants to make our churches holy of holy churches. I think that's so important. I think it's so important as we move into the end of the age that, that Paul, he talked about this in, in uh, Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. You can turn there and read it, but he, you could just see the apostle was gripped by this burden. And he says, Moses used to go up on the mountain and he would cover his face and he would encounter God's glory to such a measure that he had to come down off the mountain 
and he had to put a veil over his face because the glory of God was radiating off his face and the children of Israel would look at him and be like, whoa, that's way too much light. Moses, just cover your face because it's blinding us. And Paul makes an incredible statement. Paul says, how will the ministry of the Holy Spirit fail to be with even more glory than what Moses experienced. And I think if you read the context of that passage, he wasn't talking about when we go to heaven. Paul was gripped with a burden back in the first century to say, Moses had such a glory that his face radiated with light, and yet he was under the law. We have grace, and we have the Holy Spirit, and we have a new covenant, and how much more glory should we expect and I think as we head to the end of the age that the Lord is going to have a glorious church. The Lord is going to have a glorious church, Ephesians chapter 5, that he will present to the church, he will present the church to himself in all of her glory. See, at the, as we head to the end of the age, which I believe we are moving at a rapid pace towards that time, we need the glory of God. We need the holiness of God. We need the glory of God back in our churches, back in our local gatherings of the ecclesia. When, when we say the Holy Spirit, his, his uh, inheritance in the saints, the Holy Spirit's inheritance in the saints is to have a corporate temple. We've got to understand that means a gathering of God's people, the holy of holies, the glory of God. The second thing the Holy Spirit is yearning for and jealous for is for God to have a spiritual house. See, so many people get so focused on a visitation, a revival, signs and wonders. I love all of those things. I love all of those things. All of those are great. But God wants more than a sporadic visitation. God wants our local gatherings to be his habitation. God doesn't want to just visit. God wants to dwell with you. God wants to dwell in the midst of you as a flaming presence of glory and fire. He wants a habitation. He wants a spiritual house. Now, as we talk about the spiritual house... We've got to understand that when he talks about the spiritual house, he's quoting here from, uh, or, or, or actually I'm going to quote what Peter said. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You also, as living stones, think about that. You are living stones. You're being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit's inheritance in the saints is a spiritual house comprised of his people who are living stones. Now, I want us to break apart these two phrases, living stones and God's spiritual house. Living stones. Is God, listen, God is not building his house with carnal or fleshly people. God is not building his house. He's building his house with living stones, not with dead stones. See, a lot of times people think the church is the, those people who gather on a Sunday. Well, no, that's not really the church. That's not fully the church because a lot of the people that gather there aren't even saved. God is not building his house with those who don't have Christ in them. God's building his spiritual house with those who have the Spirit of God inside of them. He's building his house with living stones. He's building his house with living stones. Not only does it mean that we have the life of Christ in us, but God has us. That means God possesses us. A, a, a stone can, be, can have the life of God but not be living. It can't be this, this, this dead stone that even though Christ is in there, God doesn't have this particular vessel and so God wants to possess every individual living stone from the very core of their being, spirit, heart, soul, body, that we would be a possession of the Holy Spirit. We would be his possession. God, 
See, the Lord is building his house with spiritual stones, living stones. I know that, you know, one of the big problems we have today is so many, because of the seeker-sensitive church culture that's been established, I know especially in the Western world, it's so many people that gather together on Sunday are not even the Lord's people. And so many churches that are operating are not operating under the government of Jesus Christ. It's a man-made government. And I don't care how how spiritual it looks or how powerful it seems. If Jesus is not the head, then I think God wants to call his people out to a church who is truly under the headship of Jesus Christ. And so God is building his house with spiritual people. Now, Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 through 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And I'm not going to read this just for the sake of time, but I want to say if you read it, what you'll come away with is you see three categories of Christians. Number one is you see the carnal Christian. The carnal Christian is is one who lives by the dictates of their flesh, what their body wants, what they crave, what their uh, five senses desire, what their eyes see, what their ears hear what their nose smells, all these five senses stimulate them and move them and drive them, what their body desires. They live by the carnal Christian lives to satisfy their body. The second category that Paul lists here is the soulish Christian. See, you you, you can deny your flesh but still be a soulish Christian. Paul said that the natural man, that word natural is the, in the Greek means of the soul. The soulish man. You can be soulish and still have Christ in you. That means you're, you're living by the soul. The soul is leading you. Self-life is leading you. The mind, the will, the emotions are leading you. So the soulish man is one or woman. Uh, The soulish person is one who lives by their thinking, by their reasoning, by their logic, by their intelligence, by the mind, and all that the mind is, or by their emotions. You know, a lot of Christians think like that the ultimate pinnacle experience is to fill God with your emotions. And a lot of people, if they don't fill God with their emotions, they think, okay, God's not present, God's not here. Well, that's still living by the soul, living by this emotional high. I know that when I, when, as a young believer, that if I didn't experience God in worship and get chill bumps and tears and this emotional rush that came from the, the music being played, I almost felt like I, I couldn't encounter God. And, you know, I didn't realize it then, but I was really a soulish believer, living in the soul, having to have an emotional experience. Now, I'm all for you experiencing God with your emotions, but we just can't be led by the emotions and think, okay, if we don't experience God with our emotions, then therefore we haven't connected with Him. And I, you know, whatever it could be, your, your soul, your will, what you want, what you desire, your preferences, all of that stuff, God wants to nail to the cross because God does not build His spiritual house with carnal stones, soulish stones. He builds them with spiritual stones. Spiritual stones, now when I talk about spiritual people, just first of all, let me just say, I have been in the charismatic movement for pretty much my, it seems, I don't know, 25 years maybe. I'm trying to think, yeah, over 25 years. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, you know, a lot of times when you, in your charismatic church, when you think about someone who's spiritual, you think about someone waving banners or every other sentence blowing a shofar during the message or, you know, they, they can't carry on a normal conversation without talking about the Bible or, and I'm, I love that people have a heart for God, but, you know, what I'm talking about the over-spiritual uh, people is... That's not what I'm talking about, that the, those super spiritual people that, frankly, can get on your nerves sometimes. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. But that's not what Paul has in mind when he says the spiritual people. 
What Paul's talking about is that your spirit is the leader. Your spirit, who is one with the Holy Spirit, is now taking full control of your life. The Holy Spirit now is bringing your mind, your will, and your emotions under the reign of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is now your leader. The, the Holy Spirit is now making your spirit the strongest part of you. So now that deep inward place in you of your spirit who knows all things and can discern all things, who operates by intuition and revelation and communion with Christ, that place of intimacy with him, that is what is leading you. And then from that place, your soul is expressing through your personality, through your mind, through your reasoning, through your emotions, through your will, that the life of Jesus Christ. So spiritual people, what it means to be a spiritual man or a woman, it means the spirit of God inside of you is governing you, leading you, bringing your soul into dominion, bringing your flesh into dominion, and that you are now being led by the spirit of God. All who are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. So that's what Paul means when he's talking about the, the living stones, God, again, that doesn't mean every, that doesn't mean if you're spiritual that you're perfect. It doesn't mean you don't ever make mistakes. It doesn't ever, it doesn't mean you never operate in the, from the soul. It doesn't mean you you're, don't, aren't led by the soul or led by the body. But more and more and more, we're, we are growing in this ability to be led by the Spirit of God from our spirit. Now, Hebrews 4.12 is a very important scripture as it relates to uh, preparing God's spiritual house. And the author of Hebrews talks about it. I'm sure you're familiar with it, but let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The author of Hebrews talks and he writes that the, the word of God, I want you to catch some of the, the incredible revelation in this scripture the word of God is a sharp, two-edged sword. It pierces as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrows, able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So what we have here is we have the analogy of a sword cutting a sacrifice. And you think about in the old covenant, the priest would take the Take the Old Testament sacrifice, a bull or a lamb or a ram or whatever it was, and he would take the knife and he would just slice that, that animal in two and split it open so you could see everything inside. And the author of Hebrews is saying that's what God's word is like. God's word is now taking you who are the living sacrifice and his word is coming and he's splitting you in half and laying you bare so that you can see what parts of you are in operation. You can see that, oh, what I've been doing has been my soul. I've been, I've been being led by my mind, my emotions, my will, thinking that it was God, when in fact the word of God comes and divides between soul and spirit and shows you, no, that is not what has been leading you. It's not it's not the spirit of God where Christ dwells. It is your own human soul thinking that your thoughts and your emotions were being led by God. Now, how many have experienced that before where the Lord shows you, you thought I was speaking this to you. You thought I was saying this to you, but in fact, that is your soul masquerading as my voice. Now, if you've been in this long enough, you, you've experienced that. All of us have experienced that where we try or we, th we mistake what thoughts are coming into our, into our heart, into our mind as the voice of God when it really is just the voice of the soul. And so there needs to be this division. And this purpose of this division, here's the purpose of this division is God, God comes with this two-edged sword and he divides between soul and spirit because the Lord wants to make your spirit the leader. God wants to make your spirit the strongest part of your being. See, whatever is the strongest part of our being is going to be the part that leads us 
and guides us. If we're carnal, that means our body is the strongest part of our being. If we're soulish, that means our mind, will, and emotions are the strongest part of our being. But God comes with this sharp two-edged sword as us as a living sacrifice, and he divides that sacrifice and exposes us by his living active word. So now he says, your soul's been leading you. Your body's been leading you. I want your spirit where I dwell to now lead you because he wants to make us spiritual people. He wants to make us those living stones fit together as a dwelling place of God and the Holy Spirit so that this local gathering we call the church or the Lord calls the church, the ecclesia can become the dwelling place of God and the Spirit by living stones fit together. Just one comment about that is when the Lord's sword comes, when the Lord's two-edged sword comes, I just want to say you've got to recognize the difference between conviction and condemnation. When the Lord comes, he convicts you. He says, Brian, that thought right there is not from me, it's your soul. Now, he does it lovingly. He does it as a loving bridegroom, as a shepherd, because he wants to make me spiritual. Whereas the devil comes and he accuses and he condemns and he puts on guilt and shame and condemnation and all this, he heaps on you all these different things. So we've got to really be able to recognize the voice of God which convicts you and challenges you and moves you forward into life from the condemnation and the, the accusation of the devil that accuses you and says, you're a hopeless hypocrite. You'll never amount to anything. You're not worth anything. You know, we, I'm sure you've all, we've all experienced that, haven't we? And so God wants to come and say, no, know my voice that convicts versus the, knowing my vo the enemy's voice that condemns. Okay, now we're on page seven uh, in the notes is the body of Christ. It is, let's turn back now to Ephesians chapter one, verse 22. Ephesians 1, verse 22, is the verse we read earlier when Paul talked about the body of Christ. So you think about this, and if you've grown up in the church, you know this, and you probably have heard this before, but the church is not a building. The church is not a Sunday service. The church is not a place you go to hear a message and sing some music. The church is not an event. The church is not an organization. See, the church is a living, breathing, organic expression of the life of Jesus Christ by those who have the Spirit of God in them and have the Spirit of God possessing them who are spiritual people fit together with other spiritual people, not carnal or soulish, but other spiritual people into a place that is a living stone's where the Spirit of God can dwell. That's the church. That's the body. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I, I just, sometimes you just read the scriptures and you're like, oh man, what the church has done and how we've missed what God wants us to be as a local expression of Jesus Christ that gathers together, not under the headship of man, not under the headship of the government of man, men building their own kingdom but under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how beautiful if we could get back to that, if we could get back to what the church is meant to be. That even though God has fivefold ministers, pastors, prophets, teachers, evangelists, um, apostles and prophets, even though God has those fivefold ministries and their facilitators, they are not the head. Jesus Christ is the head. And if Jesus Christ is the head, that means we are his body. We are the expression in a local gathering of the body of Christ. It is a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. We need to get back to what it is meant, what God wants in his body, in his ecclesia. See, the body of Christ is the fullness of him who fills all in all. The fullness of him who fills all. He's in all of the members of his body. Christ in you, and he 
fills all of the members of his body as we yield to him and say, Lord, be Lord, be king, be, have total, complete control of me. See, God wants to take these scattered individuals who are just off on these islands in isolation. He wants to bring the living stones together as a corporate expression of, of the body of Jesus Christ. That is the eternal purpose. And so I just want to say, and I know that there are, you know, the, the, there are so many people out there that have been hurt by the church, and I get it. I really do. I mean, just, just even... Even as I'm speaking this, a, a huge mega church ministry that's planted many churches, the top leader and some of the other leaders have been exposed for inappropriate behavior. And just the hurt and the pain that's caused. I, I, I get it that, that, that so many people have been burnt out by and hurt and wounded by the church and by uh, leaders with, with bad motives and bad ambitions and all that. But I just want to encourage you, if you've experienced that, don't give up on the local church. Just make it a huge priority in your prayer life. Lord, show me where you want me to go. Plant me where you want me to be. Because we've got to come together and be that local expression of the life of Jesus Christ. Because we will never come into God's eternal purpose if we're an island, if we're a lone ranger, if we're in isolation, me and Jesus in the prayer closet. No, God needs us together fit together, working together as, as living stones fit together. Jesus is coming back for a united bride, not a disconnected harem. He's coming back for a united bride. The bride of Christ at the end of the age will be united. They will be one. God, and I'm not saying by trying to force unity I, I, if you've been around long enough and you've seen the people that have tried to force unity, you realize, okay, I don't want any part of that. I'm talking about an organic expression of the life of Jesus Christ as you are led by the Holy Spirit and as others are led by the Holy Spirit. And, and I'm sure you've experienced this, but when you come together, this is like this kindred spirit of connection and oneness where, you know, you could be... 20 years younger, 20 years older, and you just have this bond with somebody, well, that's the Spirit of God connecting you. The Lord wants to bring His church together in a, in a Holy Spirit-led unity that connects the body of Christ. That is the local church. God wants to bring the local church into that unity, and then the global church as well. But God, we've got to have each other. We've got to have each other. Now, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32. This is an incredible scripture verse that Paul is unpacking. And it's one of those things, you, you may not catch it right when you read it, but if you, st if you stop there and go, wait, what is he saying? That, that's awesome. I mean, it's one of those things where if you pause for a moment and really press in to get the meaning of it, you realize, okay, that is an incredible statement that Paul made. And I think if we can get this, then it'll change the way we view church. Paul said, give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Now, in the first century, this was such a revolutionary statement that, a, that the first century church referred to the church as the third race. You had the Jews, you had the heathen Gentiles, and you had the ecclesia of Jesus Christ. And they refer to themselves as the third race. Isn't that incredible? They were an entirely new creation, not of the Jews, not of the Gentiles, but they were born of the Spirit of God. They were not under Adam as the federal head. They were under Christ, who was the head of the church. And they had the Spirit of God. They were regenerated. Their spirit was now connected, one with the Holy Spirit, righteous and complete and holy and a partaker of the divine nature. Now their body and their soul were coming into unity under, under submission to the Holy Spirit. And as they came together and were connected, they realized we are the living expression of the body of Jesus Christ in the earth. We're like a third race. Man, if we could get that, 
If we, you know, I, I, all of us, all of us, myself included, get into the rut of thinking, okay, I got to go to church. We're going to church. It's 10 o'clock. We got to get ready to go to church. You know, we got to be there in 30 minutes to go to church. We got to go to the church service. But if we could have this paradigm shift, and if everyone in the church could have this paradigm shift, is we're not going to church. We are the living expression of the body of Jesus Christ gathered locally together on a Sunday under the headship of Jesus Christ to have his life expressed in us and through us as we gather together. It is a completely different paradigm and way to view it. It is powerful. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Could we not get back to God's original intention for what church is meant to be? I think maybe if we could do that, church would not be so terribly boring for some. Now, hopefully you don't say that if you've heard me preach, because that wouldn't make me feel good. But you get the point. A lot of us are like, oh, I got to go to church. That's probably one of the reasons why church attendance after, this, after the COVID pandemic has declined in a pretty substantial way all across the world. And it doesn't seem like a lot of people are coming back because they think, well, I can just get the content online. I can just watch online. I can just worship online. We've missed the ecclesia of God. We've missed the gathering of the corporate. We've missed the beauty of what happens when we come together under the headship of Jesus Christ, living stone to living stone, fit together to be a dwelling place of God and the Spirit. I think if we had that revelation, you know, a lot of the church growth experts are kind of like, okay, what can we do? What model can we implement to get people back into the building? I think we need to come back to the understanding of what church really is. The ecclesia of God the third race, the living expression of Jesus Christ when we come to gather corporately, fit together. If we can recover the vision that Paul had, reaching back into the eternal purpose of God, I think then it's, a, it's something where you can't get this online. You can't get this by listening to YouTube videos or watching on Facebook or reading on Instagram or whatever, but you can't get this in those contexts. You've got to be together with other like-minded, spirit-filled, connected believers that are, that are joined and fit together. Jesus is the head of his church. Now that would apply globally for sure, but it also applies at a local church level. And I would say, if you're unsure if Jesus Christ is truly the head of your church, I would make it a prayerful consideration to find out where he would want you to be. Because there's many, many churches right now that are operating under the government of man, men building their own kingdoms, men doing what they want to do, men preaching what the people want to hear rather than what Jesus is saying for them to preach. That if you are in that situation and, you, and you're not sure whether or not Jesus Christ is truly the head of the local gathering you're attending, then I would encourage you very much to make it a matter of prayer. Lord, should I still be here? Now, hopefully no one listening to this from our church is wondering that. Or if you're a pastor, it's a great question to ask for yourself. Is Jesus really the head of my church? Am I really submitted to the head of Jesus Christ, am I really speaking what he wants me to speak? Am I really being a voice that gives expression to what he's saying to this local ecclesia? Or am I, only, am I preaching my favorite subjects or what the people want to hear? Am I withholding what needs to be said because I'm afraid people might leave? See, we need Jesus back as the head of his church. We need Jesus back as the head of his church and us, including leaders, being submitted to him, the head, and everyone, even the fivefold ministry then, giving expression to what Jesus Christ is saying. I think if we can get back to that original vision and not get out of our minds what, you know, almost 2,000 years of church history has morphed the church into... I think it would be a life-changing, life-altering situation. We would never, ever want to miss church again if we really, really understood what it's meant to be. So let's recover that vision that God has. Amen. So now, 
before, before Jesus comes back, and I would say as you look at the news and you look at what's going on in the world and the unfolding of events that are taking place and the rapid pace of things, I mean, it, you know, it's easy to look at the, the negativity. It's easy to look at the darkness and just be like, oh, this is sick. This is grieving. This is terrible. I mean, just the, the nonsense that's going on, the absolute perversion being pushed even on young kids and governments trying to take over and make, our, make a, a one-world government and all that's going on. I mean, we're, we're definitely, definitely in, in birth pains for sure. I think what we need to understand is that before Jesus Christ comes back and he takes over the kingdoms of this world, Revelation eleven fifteen. the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Before that happens, Jesus, the Spirit, the Spirit of God in the local church wants to bring us in our heart, in our soul, by our mouth, by our body. He wants to bring the church into submission to Christ the head. That before God brings everything in heaven and on earth under the headship of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God wants to bring us under his headship. Where we don't just say, Lord, and he's not really Lord. Where we don't just say, Lord, Lord, and do what we want. Do what's right in our own minds. Do what, how we feel. Do based on what reason says. But we're doing only what God is saying to do. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. Before he comes back to, to conquer the kingdoms of this world and make them his own kingdom, he's first coming to the church to conquer us and bring us under his headship in every single dominion and area. And I would say, as we look at the world and what's taking place, it sure seems like things are moving at a rapid pace that would say, and that would alert me, let's now come under the headship of Jesus Christ like never before and let him be Lord of every part of our being. God is waiting for the church to grow up. I love what Mike Bickle likes to say. He says, many saints are waiting to go up at the rapture, but God is waiting for the church to grow up. That is the heart of God. The Father wants, the Father will have a mature representation of his son before Christ comes back and in his people. And so a lot of people are like, okay, when's the rapture coming? And especially as these events we're witnessing seem to be escalating, we're like, okay, when's the rapture coming? When's the rapture coming? Instead of waiting to go up, how about we learn to grow up into him who is the head? That we want to grow up into Christ who is the head. The body expresses Christ's life. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 15 is, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? And we talked about this just a minute ago, that the body of Christ was the third race. But I want you to see now 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Turn in your, let's go ahead and just turn in your, your scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. Paul is writing, and I, again, another one of those profound statements. You're like, wait, what? What did he just say? It's one of those things. I didn't get it until just recently. It's just a profound statement. But Paul's writing, and he says, Even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. Now catch this right here. So also is Christ. So Paul's talking right now, and he says, he uses the analogy of the human body, and he says that's what we're like, joined to Christ. But he says the human body has many different members. But he says, so also is Christ. In other words, what he's saying here is the body of Christ on earth is Christ. 
That does not make us Jesus Christ. That's not what he's saying. It doesn't make us gods. Not, none of that, none of that. What it means is we, the church, those who have Christ in his life, are the literal expression of Jesus in the earth. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. What, again, if we could come, if we could just remember this, we literally are the, the, the hands and the feet of Christ. We are the expression of his body in the earth. We express his life. What a profound revelation. Now, it was interesting. Where did Paul get this revelation? Well, I think one of the places he got this revelation was when he had that first encounter with Christ when he was still named Saul. And he's going to Damascus and Saul of Tarsus is going to, to persecute Christians. And all of a sudden, the, this light flashes out of heaven, knocks Paul to the ground, knocks the horse to the ground. And this, I think the horse, but definitely Paul, the, the light of God comes in, and it's, it's not just any light. It's the light of Jesus Christ, and Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul's like, wait, let me get this straight. You have already gone to heaven. <laughs> I don't know if he said that because he wasn't a believer then, but he, the Lord had already gone to heaven, and he appears to him some years later, and yet Paul is persecuting Christians, but Jesus says, you're persecuting me. The reason is because the body of Christ is Christ. When we persecute his people, we persecute the Lord. When we take care of his people, we take care of the Lord. We bless the Lord. That is how Jesus views his people. It's the very extension of his body. It is his body. And the way we treat or talk about the church is how we treat or talk about the Lord. See, we need to have this different view of the church. And then you can also see that same dynamic taking place when in, uh, in the parable of the sheep and the goats. When the Lord, and I won't go into all the details, but the Lord was basically saying when you take care of these brothers of mine, you take care of me. When you feed these brothers of mine, you, you feed me. When you visit them in prison or they're homeless or sick, when you take care of them, you take care of me because the body of Christ is literally the extension of Christ in the earth because of the spirit of Christ in them. That's the way he views it. So we need to get back to that incredible view of what the church is and what the body is. And so as we bring this message to a close, let me, let me turn to, or just, let me just talk about Ephesians 4.13. As Paul was talking about God's ultimate intention is that he would have a mature man. The fivefold ministry is meant to bring about a mature man, a mature representation of Jesus Christ. So that every local church is meant to be a mature representation of Jesus Christ in that local gathering. The, the body of Christ around the world is meant to be a mature representation of Jesus Christ in the earth. That is God's ultimate intention. That is what God is aiming for as this age comes to a close. What is God after? What does God want to do? A lot of people get focused on the negativity going on and Jesus is going to come back soon. Well, I would say, look instead at the church. Do you see the church being made ready? Do you see the church coming into maturity? Do you see the church growing into Christ's likeness? Do you see the church doing that? Because that is the true barometer of whether or not he's coming back soon because he's coming back for a bride made ready and a, and a mature representation of his son in a people. So as we bring this to a close, know the Holy Spirit's inheritance in the saints is a temple in which he dwells, a corporate temple. It's a house that he occupies and builds by living stones. And it's a body he possesses. Amen.